Welcome back to In Conversation. This is a video series I do with authors from all different realms of traditional publishing to talk about all sorts of different topics. And today we're talking about how to approach feedback, magic and world building edition with Tracy Dion. And I'm going to let her introduce herself. Yes, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be able to talk about this super niche topic, which is something that I don't think we really get to dig into as much, especially when talking about feedback. Um, so I'm Tracy Dion. I am the author of Legendborn, which comes out September 15th from SNS. Um, and this book is a contemporary fantasy YA novel, uh, the first in a series. It's about a 16 year old girl named Brie who's grieving her mother and she decides to infiltrate a secret society on a university campus because she believes that the society um, who call themselves the Legendborn may have something to do with her mother's death. Um, things get sort of complicated when they reveal that they are the descendants of the Round Table, um, with King Arthur and his knights, and she has to decide whether or not she's going to work with them uh, in their magical war or take them down from the inside as she tries to discover what their involvement was with her mother's death. Yay! It's wonderful. It is a fantastic book. I stayed up very early in the morning finishing because I was so addicted to it. And I'm going to put all the links below so you can get your pre-order on, do your Goodreads adding, all of that. And I think it's going to be really cool also to see this because you've also got a contemporary fantasy. So there's kind of that mix of like the magic system and world building, but also interacting with the real existing world. Yeah, absolutely. How do you go about organizing your world building feedback? Sure, yeah. You know, I think the first thing that I do, even before I solicit feedback or before I read it, let's say, before I really sit down and process someone else's feedback, is try and remind myself why I have the magic in place in the book. Um, you know, I think a lot of us uh, who build magic systems are familiar that, you know, with the sort of adage, like your magic has to have a, a cost, your magic has to have a rule system or else it, you know, is just hand wavy this all the time without consequences. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also try and remember what I'm trying to communicate to the reader and to the protagonist through magic. So you know, do certain parties have magic and other parties don't? Do, you know, is there certain types of magic that can get practiced that other people don't? Usually magic is a stand-in for power dynamics. Mm -hmm. um, so I try to remember what I'm trying to communicate about power at that point in the story. Um, and if I kind of keep that as my core, my central sort of bit of knowledge that I'm holding on to, and then the feedback um, that I read, I can sort of filter through whether or not it serves that. I mean, this is a rule of thumb for any feedback, but I think for magic in particular, as you're building it, um, it's good to remember that, you know, the system itself um, needs to be able to grow. And so you do need to, and it needs to be flexible enough to grow and change or else readers will get boring. Mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't mean that the purpose behind the system needs to necessarily be up to anybody's whim. Like you're the, you're the author, you're the one who really knows what you're trying to show with your magic. So that's the, the main rule of thumb. And then in terms of organizing what I do get, I color code. Like, so if I get an edit letter from my editor, I will color code. And, you know, in my book, there are a few different ways of using the magic. And so I um, color code with different, you know, systems for each aspect, each use. Mm -hmm. uh, I won't, without spoiling, I won't get into what those all are, <laughs> but there are different ways of using magic in Legendborn, um, and I try and tease those out. Um, and I color code also on my whiteboard. Um, you can't see it because the way the camera is facing, but I have several whiteboards in my house, and one of them um, I definitely had like columns of like this magic system and these rules, this magic system and these rules, and it was almost like a spreadsheet in that the mm -hmm. row you know, running across had a common element, which is like, you know, what does it look like? Well, each system has a different look and feel. How does it feel when you use it? What are some key words? And so as I'm getting feedback, I can kind of slot, sort of slot that in to each of the spreadsheet items and say, okay, is that, does that jive with what I had intended? Is that really feedback about this system or is it feedback about how it plays with other things? And sort of like try and, you know, but the, the common theme, I think, is just remember what you're trying to do um, mm -hmm. so that you can apply the feedback in the correct place rather than letting feedback 
you know, take over your whole your vision and change everything that you thought you were doing. You don't want feedback to do that because that's so hard. Um, sometimes you do, but like for the most part, I think with a magic system specifically, you don't want someone, one, one paragraph or one sentence from one person to completely destroy everything you've put in place because there's a reason why it was there. And, you know, there's something salvageable probably. Yeah, that's so good. I like what you're talking about, about like having that base for yourself of, okay, this is really what I'm trying to do. And that way you can, like you said, incorporate that feedback and you can see kind of right away what feedback doesn't fit in with that. And like, you're like, okay, well, that's actually not what I'm trying to do. And so then you don't take that on or you rebuttal. However, the polite rebuttal of no is. <laughs> and like that organization too, of all the color coding. I feel like I'm doing like the chaotic version. Of <laughs> uh, possibly because I don't plot my world building, though I would like to do that in the future. But it's really interesting to hear that to like have you know that you have that core and that sort of thing um because yeah i feel like that's something i have in the back of my head but i don't put it together that way i'm just kind of like uh i know what feels right and i know what feels wrong yeah and it's kind of just like the way i've always done it but it's really cool to hear you say it like that like because that is really what it is you know what you put in place and you know what you're trying to do with it and it's kind of sticking to that and that can really help you pull out feedback that works for you or doesn't. Well, and you know, some of that I think is, you know, I have a different, I have, I, I think an interesting background when it comes to organizing information. Um, I used to be a project manager. Um, um, I was also a stage manager and I was a house manager in theater. All coming together now. Yeah, so like I <laughs> oh, have- whiteboards makes sense. Yeah, the whiteboards, the spreadsheets, like that's just how I organize information. I'm a visual person, so I really, it really does help me to see, you know, okay, this information goes in this column or this row, here's where it intersects. I did that with fight scenes. Like I, you know, I found a way to use spreadsheet in so many different ways um, in this book. And I think I always will because that's how I think. But I also, you know, there's something to be said too about, um, you know, remaining flexible even in that. Like I use that to organize my thinking. I never let a spreadsheet um you know be so set in stone that i wasn't flexible later when i got new information so i think i revised you know the same spreadsheet probably like six or seven times as i was writing legendborn um and in terms of magic i mean some of the best feedback that i could get and you know was always around where it felt part mm -hmm. for people um, and I think that's the type of feedback, that flavor of feedback is something that is always worth listening to and writing out why it, why you think it makes sense, right? Because like sometimes I would get feedback that specifically like this doesn't hold water or I don't understand why this would happen. Like you taught me this rule earlier in the book. So why does it not apply here? And that type of feedback about magic system and world building is so important because your readers are going to, someone else is going to have that same thought. So if it's, you know, I think I put magic system feedback in different categories and one of them certainly is like, wouldn't it be cool if, you know, or I just think that it would be, this is almost like this magic system in this existing world, or this is a little bit like, you know, Lord of the Rings, or this is a little bit like the magicians. Like if someone's trying to sort of pull your and stretch your magic system into a new comp, you know, that's, that's interesting and iffy and you have to be careful. But if someone's saying, I'm with you, I'm on board with your magic, but here's where you lost me. All, I think always pay attention to that because I, you know, that's, that's, there's something there that maybe you have in your head. It's just not on the page yet. Yeah. Where they just didn't get it. Um, or there's something that really and truly didn't make sense. I mean, there are definitely a couple moments in Legendborn towards the end. This is where I think a lot of things happen. You're trying to like pull things together. Yeah. And someone's like, yeah, this scene looked cool, but like five chapters ago, you said blank. So like, I just didn't understand why this person had this power now. Like they didn't in that, in, you know, you find yourself being like, because I wanted to, <laughs> like, that's usually a flag, a little pink flag that like, yeah, <laughs> you could have probably helped your reader because you can do a lot of things just because you want to, but you don't want your reader, you know, saying like, you know, I committed, I was with you, Tracy, or like I was with you, Lizelle, and then all of a sudden you you turned left and I couldn't be with you anymore. Like you don't want that. 
five. That's never fun. Because from the reader's end, it's like when you're reading, it's such a betrayal because you're like, <laughs> I, you set me up for all of this and I was so on board and I was so excited. And then suddenly you just like gave this person a power for no reason and I didn't see it coming and now I'm mad. Yes. <laughs> yes. You, block, you just like pulled it out of nowhere. Whenever, yeah, that's where you, you don't want to be there. It's a bad feeling, right? Like we all have had that experience where it was just like, hold up, I've been <laughs> lied to. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, you don't want that. So I, you know, that's where I will always pause and say, you know what, let me, let me sit with that for a second. But I do find for me, I still have to process that and turn it into something. It doesn't mean that, um, whatever that person suggests, if they say, you should do this, you should do it. I mean, that's rule number one, I think about any feedback is if someone gives you a solution, you have to really trust that they understand what your intentions are before you take it. Because oftentimes what they're pointing out is a problem and it's your job to figure out the solution, not theirs. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, sometimes when people are like, okay, that doesn't work for me, then I have to write a whole, I find myself writing a whole two paragraph either a justification or an alternate explanation. And I have to actually write it out so that I can see if it holds water, like a legal document, you know? <laughs> like, I'm like, yeah, you're right, let me like, if I can't make it make sense, if I can't put it into words, then maybe it's not good, you know? Yeah, and I find that's like a lot of my process, maybe because I get so much of my feedback in the form of questions, but I'll like list out all of those questions and I'll just start answering them. And sometimes my answer is, no, I just haven't hinted this well enough for you. And this is why this happens. And I'll do better at like hinting that for you, but it's not wrong and it's not not working. I just haven't made it clear for you as a reader why it works. Yes. And like, that's the process of like going down those questions. And I will, I will like write like huge paragraphs because a question will sometimes be something I just haven't thought of because that's the chaotic way that I world build. And I'll be like, oh, do people care about that? Like um, one of, in my book, like there's a ceremony around like shedding of blood. And my editor, Sarah was like, where does the blood come from? And I was like, oh, do people care about that? <laughs> and I was like, I guess I can tell you. Yeah. I, yeah, I know it. I just haven't put it in because in right. my mind, I'm like, I don't know, it's magic blood. Do you care where the magic blood comes from? I oh, guess you do, gosh. now we're explaining. I feel like that's such a good actual note. Like, how do you, it's so hard as writers, you know, to know what the reader, to always know what the reader cares about with magic. Mm -hmm. Because I think we all suspend, we're all comfortable with some suspension of disbelief, particularly nowadays with how much science fiction and fantasy there is in the world. I think if someone were to say, you know, because of, she who shall not be named, but like if someone were to be like, you have a wand and you say these words and then X happens, I actually don't need to know the mechanics of the wand, yeah. but I do find that there are other types of magic where I'm like, okay, but how did he do that? Yeah. You know, like I need more information. So it is good to have feedback from someone who can say, I needed more information here. Or like, maybe it's even like what you asked. It's like, where did you need more? Where did you not care? Because sometimes yeah, we as yeah. writers can go down rabbit holes and explain all this stuff. And they're like, I didn't need to know that. Just tell me that it works. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes it's the explanation too. Like, is the explanation interesting enough to warrant that? Like if I had pulled out some like long scientific reason for why there's extra blood, blood. I'm like, you know what? Let's not. But because it was a whole like, blood of your ancestors and like the history of their ancestors and the suffering the symbolicness of it it was like okay yeah I, i'll put that in that adds to the story and that adds to the richness of the world building so then it's worth it but there are definitely some cases where i've been like i explained why something's happening and it's been like oh uh, that's like a lot of science that nobody really needed get involved in and so let's just either simplify or let's just like not talk about that there's a, a phrase that i use for world building um in magic it works for magic too um, that i learned from educating uh, from being an educator and in pedagogy there's this phrase about how to introduce information to a student so that they can use it mm -hmm. and i mean that's teaching right and um the phrase is just in time information versus just in case 
in, you know, the dreaded info dump is just in case. Like that's information you're giving to somebody just in case they might use it, just in case they might find it interesting, just in case you need to refer back to the point, you know, that it's convenient for you to say, I gave it to them in paragraph one, you know. Yeah. Um, whereas just in time information only appears when they need, when the reader or the protagonist needs it and, or it happens just before they need it. Mm -hmm. So it's fresh in the reader's mind. And I find that that happens a lot with magic systems. Like there's some nuances that you can introduce and this is like a, a gut thing that only a reader writer knows is like where you, you know that they can let they you can introduce a fact and they'll hang with you the reader will hang with you for a few chapters before they need more yeah. like you have to know you have to be able to gauge the tolerance of like at some point i'm gonna have to tell you how this magic works yeah. but maybe you don't need it right now um and maybe if i built up enough trust between you and me, which is a lot of the work of an author is like building up trust, then you'll hang with me for like, give me like a few pages, give me a couple chapters, you know, and like that's so hard to figure out. That's the nuance of writing that I feel like people don't, don't recognize we have to juggle, you know? Yeah. And it really depends too, because like when you have a story like yours where someone is coming into a power, then it's like, okay, you can explain a little bit less up front because you're going on that journey together of discovering versus like when you start like my character is in a world where they have always known magic and so it's like it's almost the opposite like you can't mm -hmm. sit, like the character knows so much more than the reader but you also can't just throw everything because it's like you said then it becomes that like just in case like they don't need to know everything that she knows about being mm -hmm. a witch right from the start like you kind of have to yeah it's true you're finding that balance in a sort of intuitive way that you sometimes have to learn by someone giving you feedback and saying, um, I didn't understand how this worked or like getting to a point where they're like, okay, well, where does this magic come from? Are you going to explain that to me? <laughs> no. I like, you know, this is actually kind of a cool opportunity too to talk about the types of feedback around magic system that like works for us. Mm -hmm. like, like, I think you just reminded me that what, something that really works for me is when people know when they have a question, when it appears, you know, like, oh, I thought of, so right here, I was wondering this. And then a few pages later, okay, I'm wondering that still. Or then like um, two pages later, they're like, okay, nope, now I have to have the answer. You know, like I love hearing that because that just gives me a sense of how much tolerance people have for confusion or for lack of explanation. Yeah. And that can be like more helpful in some ways than like, okay, well, what were you confused about? And then they'll just say something because it's like, well, how long were you truly confused about that? Was that like a whole time thing? Um, I find sometimes like CPs and betas will just do that naturally. They'll be like, I was confused about this thing until this thing happened. And then I kind of got it. And then you have a little bit more of an idea for sure. Yeah, I love that. Gosh, good CPs and betas, they're worth their weight in gold. Yeah. Like just to be able to say like, okay, this was interesting and cool, wonder, you know, curious about that. I mean, some of our job, you know, as readers and authors and as CPs is just to say, just to be able to articulate, hey, this is where I had a question. And because, again, it's not always as a feedback provider's job, it's not always my job to tell you how to fix it. But I, but you should know my, use my I statement. Yeah. <laughs> like, I was confused at this point. Yeah you may not care that I'm confused and that's okay. Maybe you know more than I do, you know, like as the author, but I'm just letting you know, there's a flag. Here's where I, I wasn't sure what the magic was, or here's where I trusted the magic until I stopped or whatever. So and that's, that's part of like, Trappings of feedback really is like figuring out how to take what you need and how to like not necessarily take on what other, what things don't work for you. But I also find that like balance of like even the feedback you get that kind of isn't working for you, figuring out like what it is that they're trying to get at, that maybe you can pull something useful from it out of. Um, mm -hmm. Like I had a work in progress of horror that I was doing and I had a romance originally and then I was like, you know what, this isn't working. I don't want it to be romance. It's just going to be like a friendship. And then my early, my friend who's in early beta reader, I always send her my stuff. She was like, no, she was like, do a hint of the romance at the end or something. And I was like, I'm not going to do that. But I can feel that you are 
lingering for some sort of meaningful connection yeah that, yeah like pulls this together nicely at the end and i think i can figure out how to do that with a friendship so like i'm not going to take a feedback it's not going to become romance but i can i understand kind of what you're seeking in that and like how can i kind of make that work because that speaks to me even if the romance thing doesn't speak to me yeah i had something similar with legendborn i'm trying to figure out if i can say it i think i can say it um there was discussion at one point about the relationship between um a character and one of the main characters named nick and the another main character named cell and whether or not they like you know is it what would happen if they were family members versus mm -hmm. they're not family members mm -hmm. uh, but what would happen if they were blood related like how would that change things and i think it was interesting because i think the like the idea of changing some characters base level relationship like fundamentally if you're blood related that that like creates a whole dynamic um you know a sort of a pressure you know because siblings are competing for similar resources and parental attention and yeah against each other you know it creates this whole thing right and i remember thinking like i hear what you're saying because i do think there's something there that that really could blossom but i wasn't ready to make to take the step of having them be blood related mm -hmm. um and so yeah if you if, for whoever's watching this who reads legendborn you'll get to find out how i how I'll i already put it life. together in my head yeah how i put it I together but, <laughs> <laughs> but like you know there was it is it was an interesting bit of feedback i think it was really critical because it helped me figure out well okay i don't need i don't want them to be blood related but i do think there has to be something that pre precedes Bree's um interactions with them yeah a relationship dynamic that runs deeper and goes uh is older than what we see happen when we meet them and so having a you know a pre-existing bond a pre-existing relationship was something i wanted to figure out but you're right like that was a specific suggestion but i that had a kernel of like there's a need there's a desire there mm -hmm. so how how is well how do i troubleshoot that you know and that's important i think too for like approaching when you are saying no to something you can be like no but I think this is kind of maybe what you're seeking and this is what I'm prepared to do that fits with my narrative and that fits with my idea of the book. And then this is kind of what I'm going to do going forward. Because like from a professional standpoint, like for me with my friend, she's my best friend. I've known her for like 12 years. I can say, no, I'm not going to do that to her and just like full stop because we've been friends for that long. But like when you're a professional relationship with like your editor, your agent, you yeah, can't you just be that. like, no, and like leave it. And then, <laughs> bye. Yeah. Yeah. So that's like part of it. Like really got to like think and sit with it. Yeah. I at least do for sure because I'm so soft. And so I'll immediately be like, no, I don't want to change it. So like when I sit and like marinate on things, then I can kind of come up with like, well, why do I not want to do this? And explain that and I feel like at the professional level like good agents and editors understand that and they're able to be like okay I get why you're saying this and like that all makes sense to me move on um, sometimes you might get a second pushback in which case you got to be like eh, and you navigate that on your own but like I think that's a big part of approaching feedback is like when you want to say no really examining why you're saying no and if there's anything you can work with or if there isn't Mm -hmm. raise that. Yeah, and also like, you know, I think in a professional setting in particular, I mean, you could argue this is for anybody that's a close work working relationship, or particularly a professional setting. Um, if you're writing um, a book, that's a long term project, you know, you're an editor is going to be with you consistently, you know, sort of editorially on call in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, if you have the relationship that I know that I have with Sarah, with your editor as well. Yeah, um, we have the same editor. Yeah, we have the same editor. Um, half. Half yeah, half. exactly, half. I have two editors. But, um, <laughs> but like there is that sense of like, if I really, if I'm stumped, I'm struggling, I'm stressed, I could probably email Sarah and she would probably get back within, you know, I'm not gonna put her on blast, but fast. 
just in yeah. case, <laughs> like, <laughs> she, like, 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 but publishing fast, I'll say that, you know, like, she'll get back to you. And, you know, ha that's a really important relationship and bond and something you want to respect and, and be, you know, to take care with, take care of. Um, and so, yeah, you do want to be careful how you say no. And I think everyone deserves to know why, like, to know what you're going to do, you know, with it. Like, I do wonder sometimes about stories I've heard of people just, like, just don't address the no. And I'm like, well, well I want to have a relationship, so I'm going to explain what I want to do. I think it's worth, you know, but not, it's interesting because you have to, I think what we're talking about, we both are seeing the editorial process as collaborative. Mm -hmm. And I know not everyone even approaches it from that perspective. Yeah. If you're not coming at it from that perspective, then this, this video interview is not for you. You know, like, I don't, I don't think that's what we're talking about. We're talking about people who are coming together to collaborate and like, to help build up the project. And um, that's, you have to start with that or else everything else is more difficult. So that's it for this episode of In Conversation, talking all with Tracy about approaching feedback for magic systems and world building. Um, I will have all her information below so you can check out Legendborn, you can check out her website and all her socials, all that will be below there. And of course, because this is In Conversation, please feel free to join the conversation in the comments. Um, comment with how you approach feedback specifically for your magic systems or world building. Um, if you have any questions you want to pose to us, feel free to put those in the comments. Or even just if you want to share anecdotes about how you build worlds or how you devise your magic systems, please comment with that. Uh, if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed already, please subscribe below. I post once a week on Tuesdays. And thank you so much for watching. Bye! Bye, thank you.